Welcome to PM Ready, your guide to becoming PMP certified. This is the lesson on a brief history of quality. Part 2. There are different levels of quality management. Don't worry about the specific number of levels or try to memorize this list. There are different models with three levels, four levels, five levels, and even seven levels. The concept to remember is that maturity in quality management can be measured and that it's worth learning where you are in the spectrum and what you can do to improve. The lowest level of quality management is letting the customer find the defects and then fixing them. You can advance from there to inspecting to find and fix defects before they reach the customer. Then you can move up to examining and improving the process itself so that fewer defects are generated. Even better is to incorporate quality into your planning and design processes. And best of all is to create a culture of quality throughout your organization. Philip Crosby introduced the Quality Management Maturity Grid, and you can read about it in his book Quality is Free. It's considered by some to be the inspiration of the capability maturity model. It specifies five different levels of quality management maturity. The first is uncertainty. In this case, problems are fought as they occur. There's no real long-term resolution. There's inadequate definition and lots of yelling and accusations. The phrase that Crosby uses to describe this level of maturity is, we don't know why we have problems with quality. Then the next level of maturity is awakening, in which teams are set up to attack major problems, but long-term solutions are not solicited. Crosby's phrase for this one is, is it absolutely necessary to always have problems with quality? The next level is enlightenment. At this level, corrective action communication has been established and problems are faced openly and resolved in an orderly way. This is expressed with the quote, through management commitment and quality improvement, we are identifying and resolving our problems. The next level is wisdom, in which problems are identified early in their development and all functions in the organization are open to suggestion and improvement, in which defect prevention becomes a routine part of the operation. And the highest level of quality management maturity is when problems are prevented except in the most unusual of cases, and the organization understands why they don't have problems with quality. This is a list of some of the most influential quality movements in rough chronological order. This lesson provides a brief introduction to each of them. First, we relied on inspection. Then, with the help of people like Schuert and Deming, statistical process control was introduced. From this came the Toyota production system and total quality management. The ISO 9000 series then brought together much of the best of these into standards for quality management systems. Then came Six Sigma, Lean Manufacturing, and the Theory of Constraints. Statistical process control brings statistical methods to the monitoring and controlling of processes. A notable feature of statistical process control is the control chart, which measures variation in the quality measurements of process outputs. These quality measurements would be based on whatever quality metrics are considered important, such as the diameter of ball bearings, the dimensions of automotive parts, the strength of steel, or the time it takes to load a web page. Each measurement is plotted on a graph, and the variation and trend in these measurements 
is shown on a control chart. The goal with statistical process control is to minimize variation. Some amount of variation is natural to the process, and statistical methods are used to determine this range of acceptable natural variation. If a process stays within these bounds, then it's considered to be in statistical control. If it's not staying within these bounds, then the process is considered to be not in statistical control. And the specific causes of these unacceptable variations should be identified and eliminated. These are called special cause variations. Once the special cause variations are eliminated, you can then focus on improving the process itself to systematically reduce the amount of natural common cause variation in the process. Statistical process control is based on the premise that reducing variation will result in higher quality. The Toyota Production System is the name given to the overall collection of Toyota's production philosophies, principles, policies, and practices. It's part of the Toyota Way, which includes more than just production. It was originally developed by Taiichi Ono and Eiji Toyota. It includes just-in-time production as implemented using a pull system and Kanban. Instead of manufacturing a certain quantity of parts according to some master plan, or worse, as fast as you can make them, in a push system that then pushes these parts to the next step, which creates unnecessary and costly inventories of parts between steps. In just-in-time production, you make more of a certain part when the next step down the line tells you to. Later steps in the process pull needed parts and materials from previous steps, rather than previous steps pushing them to the next steps. The Toyota production system is also highly focused on identifying and eliminating waste, and it categorizes waste and targets waste in several areas, including overproduction, time, transportation, processing, inventory, movement, defects, and underutilization. Also ever-present is the principle of Kaizen, which means continuous improvement. Another important principle is that when management hears of a situation, rather than basing decisions on second-hand information, they should literally go and look for themselves. I can't tell you how many times this has made all the difference in my experience. Total quality management has uncertain origins, but is an attempt starting in the mid-1980s to bring together the best quality principles from leaders in quality management. And it was a response to the dominance of Japanese manufacturing over U.S. manufacturing. It was quite popular in the 80s and 90s and is based on principles such as the need for the whole organization to be committed to quality, that top management needs to take responsibility for quality and not just blame the workers or their circumstances, that quality requires systematic analysis as well as a long-term commitment to continuous improvement and that the measure of quality is meeting customer requirements. The ISO 9000 series of standards provides guidelines on how to implement and maintain a quality management system. It combined and replaced numerous government procurement quality standards and has been adopted by over a million organizations that have become ISO 9001 certified. It's based on the principles of customer focus and the need to understand the needs of the customer. 
engagement of all employees invested in the success of the organization, that leadership needs to create an environment that focuses on customers and involves all employees, the need to take a process approach to quality management, looking at the whole system, not just individual processes in isolation. Continual improvement beyond certification and improving quality more and more over the long term. Making data-driven decisions and recognizing the critical importance of building strong relationships with suppliers, partners, and others, including understanding their needs and providing feedback on their products and services. Six Sigma started around 1980 with Motorola, and it was later embraced by General Electric in 1995. Since then, its use has spread to many different industries. The goal is for the outputs of your processes to be defect-free 99.99966% of the time. It emphasizes the use of statistical process control to measure defects and control variation and the importance of management leadership in quality management. It distinguishes itself in insisting that decisions be based on data and statistical analysis. A centerpiece of the Six Sigma approach is the use of the DMAIC cycle for analyzing and improving business and operations processes. DMAIC stands for the steps in this process. Define the problem or goal, measure the current state to establish a baseline, analyze to find a root cause, improve by implementing a solution to the problem, and finally control, which embeds the changes into the process in order to ensure that the improvement lasts. In other words, making the change stick. Six Sigma is also recognized for its focus on quantifying the financial results of improvements. The term lean manufacturing was first coined in 1988 and then later popularized in the book The Machine That Changed the World. Lean manufacturing principles are based on the Toyota production system and they focus on removing waste as well as smoothing the flow of the manufacturing processes. It also includes the 5S methodology, which is a way of organizing the workplace to improve quality. The first S is to sort or separate all of the items in the workplace, removing all unnecessary items. Next is straighten or set in order, which places items in their optimal locations for use. To shine is to keep the workspace clean and to make sure tools and equipment are well maintained. Standardize creates standard processes for the first S's, sorting, setting in order, and shining. To sustain is to create a culture in which the developed processes are followed by everyone without having to prompt them to do it. The theory of constraints was introduced in 1984 by Eli Goldratt in his popular book, The Goal. The theory of constraints focuses on identifying and improving the system's bottlenecks, in other words, the system's constraints. It uses three key metrics to measure the quality and effectiveness of a system. Inventory, operational expense, and throughput, which is measured in terms of money. Throughput is the rate at which the system generates money through sales. Inventory is all the money that the system has invested in purchasing things that will be converted 
into things to sell, and includes raw materials as well as work in process and inventories parts and things waiting for the next step in the process, and finished goods not yet sold. Operational expense is all the money that the system spends in order to turn inventory into throughput. You'll notice several similarities between these different quality movements or methodologies. This is in part because they build upon one another. For example, the statistical process control that was introduced by Schuert and by Deming is used in most of the quality movements that have happened since then. Removing waste and smoothing the flow is a key part of the Toyota way as well as lean manufacturing, which is based on it. Also, you'll find that there are some similarities here because by addressing one of these areas, it naturally has positive effects on other areas. In the Toyota way, there's a lot of emphasis on smoothing the flow. As you smooth the flow through a process, you naturally remove waste in the process. And it also works the other way around. As you remove waste, it tends to smooth the flow. Just-in-time or pull systems also have the effect of smoothing the flow and reducing inventories or waste between steps. Database decision-making is a key concept in virtually all quality movements. And then there's the idea of bottlenecks, or the theory of constraints. This is a different approach, in which you focus first on your bottlenecks, and you try to improve those. But as you do try to improve those, you are effectively removing waste and smoothing the flow in order to do it, as well as introducing just-in-time or pull systems. All of these methodologies and approaches also have the concept of continuous improvement. As you study these different approaches, you'll begin to see more of these similarities, how they build upon and complement each other, and how they can be applied in your organization and for your projects. In this lesson, we've introduced you to some of the key leaders in the quality movement as well as some of the key quality processes and methodologies that have come about in the last 100 years or so. You should be familiar with these people and processes and their ideas and contribution to quality management. You won't find this information in the PMBOK guide, but you are likely to see it on the PMP exam. And the more you know and understand about quality management, the more you'll be able to apply its principles to improve not only the results of your projects, but also to improve how well you manage projects. The lesson on quality tools will teach you about specific tools and techniques that you can apply to your projects. After you pass the exam, to gain a more in-depth understanding of quality, I recommend that you read some of the classic books published by the quality leaders mentioned in this lesson. PM Ready is a publication of PM Guaranteed and is based on the Project Management Institute's PMBOK Guide.